battle is the most crucial time in war, and the outcome of the battle will be decided by the courage of the soldiers and the skill of their leaders. But victory will also depend on how effectively the fighting soldiers are supplied. Nowadays, it's in giant helicopters like these that essential supplies are carried forward to the front line. Everything from bullets to biscuits, from blood to blankets. These helicopters are just the last stage in a long chain and a complex organization, without which the deadliest weapons would fall silent and the bravest soldier would die. At a US Army logistics headquarters in Germany, officers are planning the reception of an armored brigade. 17,000 men and 50,000 tons of equipment, all the way from Fort Hood, Texas. Okay, sir, what we got here, the first thing is the indications of the night draws. They're in a red dot. The object of war, according to an American Civil War general, was to get there firstest with the mostest. Nowadays, we have a more prosaic word for achieving this, logistics. The practical art of moving armies and keeping them supplied. I'm trying to check on the rail schedules for the movements of the uh, M1s, M2s, and M3s. We've had a problem with rail schedules, and I'm concerned, especially in the northern area. For a modern army, it's a massive job, like shifting a small city with all its backup services. Everything from warehouses and workshops to surgeries, cinemas and shops. By air, ship and road, the vast and deadly inventory of a 20th century army is assembled. This is the originally scheduled data. Attention to detail is vital. To make all the pieces of the complex fighting jigsaw fit together at the right time and place. Men, trucks, tanks. America flexes her sinews of war. Opposition since this unit came with only half the strength of what they were originally programmed. All you're doing right now is offloading my truck. In the 19th century, almost every man in uniform was deployed within the sound of the enemy guns. Nowadays, the job of supplies becomes so large that most soldiers never see the front line. In Vietnam, only one out of every seven soldiers was actually involved in combat. However sophisticated its use of technology, in one respect, an army of today is like every other army in history. In Napoleon's famous phrase, it marches on its stomach. Soldiers, to remain an effective fighting force, need their 3,000 calories a day. Even if it's served up in a stew, few mothers would recognize. Drop it more on the floor than you actually on the vortex. You look, not what you're doing. Look, slice, cross, mind the fingers, you'll need them. Down, make sure you stir it well, bring all the goodies to the top. I will complain, give them the full portion. There you go. Lack of food obviously has a physical effect on a soldier's body, but it has an equally damaging impact on his morale. Hunger has hastened to defeat all too often in history. So a wise commander takes immense pains to see that his troops are regularly fed. I've just been on to the CP and they tell me for the next eight hour shift that they're expecting what was left of my lot plus his own, so he should get about 6,000 really. Well, within an eight, that's right, it'll take up to about 25,000 mark. But there's Fine. no problems anyway. For much of history, it has been the feeding of soldiers that has been a general's greatest problem. And it's the problem that grew as the size of armies increased. Edward III, on his way to Cressy, had found it difficult enough to feed his 11,000 men. At the height of the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s, the Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus and his opponent Wallenstein each had armies of 100,000 men. These armies were like huge maggots, gnawing their way across the land, leaving a trail of famine and destruction behind them. 
When their food supply broke down, the soldiers took matters into their own hands, plundering the inhabitants of the areas they marched through. By the First World War, armies were numbered in millions, but the invention of tinned and dried food in the 19th century meant the feeding of armies was no longer a problem. One bakery boasted a record 172,000 pounds of flour in a single day. Graham Williams recalls other delicacies. In those days, you'd perhaps have half a side of bacon, a big sack full of loaves of bread, or a wooden crate full of tins of jam and things. Proper ration was fresh meat, or in place of fresh meat, a tin of bully beef, corned beef. Then there was tinned butter. In place of bread, or supplement the bread, there would be army biscuits, so dog biscuits. Another thing's called McConaughey. And McConaughey's beef and vegetable ration. It was stuffed in a tin. It was supposed to be easy. It made a stew. It was fairly reasonable then. But the one chap in our section would like to stuff cold, the most revolting sort of taste. In our battalion, we never had any milk at all for our tea. There was a tremendous waste of food, heaps of cheese particularly, much more than we needed. There was always a lot of that wasted, and particularly tins of bully beef. In, in certain many cases, the bottom of the trenches were so muddy, the tins of bully beef were put down there as a sort of pavement. An outstanding feature of World War II was the Allied ability to feed and supply troops anywhere in the world. But what the British Tommy wanted was tea. One medical orderly thought the five principal preventatives to shell shock were one mug of tea and four sugars. But when soldiers failed to get their regular food, as happened to the Germans on the Eastern Front, they reverted to the methods of a bygone age. We ran out of food and uh, we came to a village, a small village, and we made sure that there were no troops in there. We watched that village beforehand. Normally, we tried to skirt around the villages. We went in there, and there were about you know, five, ten families living in those few houses. And we just went in there with our... We had the weapons. They had no weapons, and they were starving, too. They had very little to eat. There were children, women, you could see it, the people were starving because it was bitter, cold weather. And uh, we took a lot when we were in units and couldn't get any food. We just uh, smashed into the villages and got everything we could get. When we found an animal, sometimes the Russians had hidden a pig somewhere or some chickens or what, we slaughtered everything. One gets ruthless. I think if one really starves, one, one looks after number one first. Soldiers have always needed other comforts to ease the tension of battle or relieve the tedium of life in the field. Away from the front line, most of these, like beer or brothels, have had to be bought. Regular pay, then, has usually been essential to keep an army contented. Indeed, the word soldier comes from the Latin word solidus, the coin used to pay the legionary his daily wage. At the front, cigarettes have been the great comforter. In both world wars, chain smoking was widespread. Under the stress of battle, smokers were willing to risk their lives to get a cigarette. And captured tobacco was one of the great spoils of war. often depends on good supplies. The United States Army has long prided itself on its ability to look after its soldiers wherever they are. In Vietnam, forward positions were supplied by helicopter. Presents from home, mail, even newspapers kept flooding in. Indeed, there were times when the abundance and variety of supply were almost an embarrassment. The rain was so extensive that the, the most of the fields were flooded the helicopters would land and sink into the mud so they weren't going to land they would get about 30 feet off the ground and start kicking out the supplies and what they were kicking out were cardboard boxes filled with new uniforms i can remember being without a, a square meal for about eight days and a helicopter flew out with a supply and, and what they dropped to us was what we called a px ration containing candy bars toilet paper cigarettes and things but not a piece of bread or not coffee that you could brew 
Ammunition, of course, has always been a vital requirement for a fighting army. But for early armies, the supply of ammunition was in fact much less of a problem than the provision of food. See, a gun like this of, say, 1640, rarely fired more than four or five times a day, using at most 100 cannonballs in a campaign. So an army of this period would take along with it its entire supply for the whole campaign. Now, this Napoleonic cannon used more ammunition, but still didn't fire more than 300 times in a campaign. It's only when we come to the guns of the 20th century that the picture changes, and then dramatically. Now, this is an 18-pounder, the standard British field gun of the First World War. During the preliminary bombardment of the Battle of the Somme in 1916, the British artillery fired over one and three-quarter million shells. And every one of these guns started that bombardment with a thousand rounds stacked on its position. First World War, ammunition had overtaken food as the largest item supplied to units in the field. By 1916, a British division in the line required 20 wagons of food each day, but 30 of ammunition. Moving grenades, small arms and field gun ammunition was hard enough, but in the heavy artillery, the work was backbreaking, as Montague Cleave knows well. The men had a colossal job to do, absolutely colossal, uh, far greater in our case than in, in the case of the field artillery, because our shells were very heavy and they had to manhandle hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. I have a record of 400 shells being fired in 40 minutes from four guns and they were at it tooth and nail. And not only then, but when the ammunition had to be replenished from the lorries behind. So much ammunition was used that only the wholesale transformation of industry could meet the demand. Then only the recruitment of women could keep the factories running. It took modern war's insatiable need for supplies to start the emancipation of women. With mechanization, the needs of armies have become more complex. Specialist units are required to keep all this equipment running and ready for battle. An increasing proportion of soldiers are not fighting men in the old sense of the term. Instead, they are servants of machinery in the age of industrialized war. Now, the essential ingredient in keeping a modern army moving is fuel. So vital is it to 20th century warfare that military campaigns have been launched to ensure a reliable supply of oil. In the day-to-day -day operations of an army, logisticians have the crucial job of getting fuel to its tanks, its planes and its trucks, by tanker, by pipeline, and if all else fails, in cans. Tank crews think not in miles per gallon, but in gallons per mile. A modern battle tank might average two gallons a mile on the road, but moving at speed cross-country will push its consumption up above three gallons a mile. In August 1944, the U.S. Third Army found a tyranny of logistics more damaging than enemy resistance as it attempted to pursue the Germans across the River Meuse. General George Patton believed that lack of gasoline prevented him from shortening the war. He made the classic remark, my men can eat their belts, but my tanks gotta have gas. In the Western desert, fuel regulated the tempo of war. In 1941, the plight of the British was worsened by one particular piece of equipment, the four gallon petrol tin. Described as flimsy and ill-constructed, General Auchinleck thought it was the cause of losing a third of his petrol supplies. To calculate the tanks destroyed, wrote Brigadier Desmond Young, the number of men who were killed or went into captivity because of shortage of petrol at some crucial moment, and then the ships and merchant seamen lost in carrying it, would be quite impossible. How many millions of gallons had gone into the sand? 
The Germans had a far more robust can. The Allies copied it, and its nickname has now become part of the English language. Jerry can. The Second World War emphasised the strong link between military power and industrial muscle. America's tremendous strength flowed from her factories and the scale of her war production was awesome. At the peak of production in 1944, they produced 2 million trucks, 100,000 planes, 84,000 tanks and 7,500 locomotives. Even the Russians, who had to move hundreds of factories to safety in the Urals, managed in 1942 to build nearly 25,000 tanks. Some factories turned out T-34s in only 30 hours apiece. For Germany, the cause was lost. At best, they could only produce 19,000 tanks a year. Right, we've got 26 ships. 4,300 passengers, 1,800 plus vehicles and 800 trailers coming through in the next 24 hours. Pull up close, convoy credit number off that side, go and pick up your real cards and shine Johnson. Okay. Supplying an army, and especially a modern one, with all its requirements, is a massive task. Indeed, most armies in the 20th century have created specialist units, like this one, the British Army's 27th Logistics Support Group Regiment, whose job is not to fight, but to transport supplies to wherever they're needed. How well the fighting men in the front line perform may well depend on how effectively the soldiers here do their job. For centuries, armies had to rely on the cart for carrying their supplies. It was slow and cumbersome, and on the atrocious roads at the time, it meant that armies could rarely travel more than 10 miles a day. The size of the baggage train grew steadily. In the 16th century, an army of 24,000 men had 3,000 carts to accompany it. But even a column of this number could not carry enough food to feed the whole army. All too soon, soldiers were forced to live off the land and often the army degenerated into little more than a rabble. Matters were made much worse if the march was going through countryside already exhausted by war. Then, soldier and civilian alike would starve. So the conduct of a campaign was governed by the problems of transporting supplies, and the successful commander was the one who mastered it. In the Austerlitz campaign of 1805, Napoleon swung more than 200,000 men and nearly 400 guns right across Europe, from the Channel Coast to what is now Czechoslovakia. His regiments moved dispersed, so as not to exhaust the countryside, and his transport units shuttled along food and ammunition in the army's rear. This mastery of logistics was a factor in his victory. In 1813, Wellington led his army against the French in Spain, where it was said a small army can be defeated, a large army starves to death. Poor farming and the barren Spanish countryside meant that Wellington's army could not live off the land. But by securing access to nearby ports, Wellington was able to import all the supplies he needed to drive the French from the peninsula. Even in this century, horses and mules have remained essential. In World War I, armies could not have survived without them. And just as the war swept thousands of young men into the army, so too it emptied the stables of Europe. A single German army needed 84,000 horses. The Germans made widespread use of horses even in the Second World War. Their infantry divisions relied, as they had for centuries, upon the horse-drawn wagon because their panzer divisions monopolized their motor transport. What shook many Allied soldiers in Normandy in 1944 
was not the sight of dead Germans, but this. It was not just the shortage of trucks that led to the survival of the transport animal. When terrain and climate proved impossible, horses and mules came into their own. For example, in Burma, conventional road transport was useless. The only track was one a man hacked through the jungle. But mules could follow soldiers anywhere. They were invaluable in the chindit operations behind the Japanese lines, and as Cyril Baldock remembers, they came in several shapes and sizes. Um, the small ones, I suppose, carried about 100, 150 pounds, perhaps even a little more, and the very big ones probably had 200 pounds. And they carried everything from picks and shovels to medical supplies, ammunition, and most important of all, of course, the wireless set, without which we wouldn't have been able to conduct the campaign nor get resupplied. The terrain that we covered during the operation varied from flat through to mountainous country where the slopes were almost vertical. And the vertical slopes weren't always dry. Sometimes it was very muddy and slippery. And on some occasions on this sort of going, the mules were unable to manage in the normal way. From time to time, they actually toppled over and crashed down with their loads right down to the bottom of crevices and ravines and we had to go down and rescue them and of course, most important as well, the load that they had been carrying. From the time we started marching in till when we went out, we must have done 800 miles or perhaps even more. In any sort of battle, but particularly in jungle area, you could be very near to the enemy without you knowing it. And of course, one of the essentials was the maximum of silence that was possible. And one thing that couldn't be allowed to happen was a mule braying when the Japanese were near. So before we went in, they all had this fairly simple and quick operation to sever their vocal cords. It's not a reversible operation. So towards the end of their campaign, some of their vocal cords would get to be workable again. We were told that the mules were a reserve larder of food for us, and it came to the crunch. And we were hungry, and we were often quite hungry, and the supplies didn't get through. Mules were offered to people. We had wounded mules, mules that couldn't go very well. It was very, very difficult. In fact, in my experience, we never ate any mule meat at all. People preferred to go hungry rather than to eat the mules. The mules were absolutely essential to the success of the campaign, and of course to our, our lives, really. The Bavarian Alps still pose transport problems, even in the age of the helicopter. Here, the West German army retains a mule unit. These mules, in another strange fusion of ancient and modern, are carrying Milan anti-tank missiles. This is one form of transport which can be relied on in all weathers. make extensive use of the railway system to move heavy equipment over long distances from far behind the lines and right up to the battle area. So familiar are railways on the 20th century landscape that it's hard to realize just how revolutionary the railway once was. A hundred years ago it really was the age of the train. In the 19th century the railway changed the face of war. Once, it had taken two weeks for an army to travel 200 miles. But by 1846, the Russians had moved 14 and a half thousand men the same distance in just two days. In Europe, in 1866 and 1870, Prussia's use of railways enabled her to concentrate her armies with such unprecedented speed and efficiency that she overwhelmed Austria and France. Railways had already played a crucial part in the American Civil War. The Confederates had the better generalship and superior tactics, 
but they were repeatedly frustrated by the ability of the North to move vast numbers of Union troops and supplies quickly by train. In August 1914, mobilization was controlled by the railway timetable. The Germans were experts in the military use of the railway, and at the height of their mobilization, one train left Cologne every minute. In World War II, a European double-tracked rail system could carry a load equal to that carried by 1,600 lorries. The rail system in Russia, however, was designed to make difficulties for any invader, as the Germans found in 1941. Only Russian rolling stock could be used on Russian rails, and most of the Soviet rail cars were destroyed or had vanished. German rail gangs had to convert an entire rail system. The railway lines in Russia, they, they have a wider gauge, and uh, as soon we uh, occupied a certain railway line, the railway troops, they followed us, and they knocked one rail back to the German gauge. But railways are vulnerable, and Russian partisans made German supply trains a prime target. Towards the end of the war, the partisans were more effective, and uh, less fuel and uh, ammunition supplies came through. The failure to recognize the importance of railways was to have a disastrous effect on the German invasion plan, and was a fundamental factor in their defeat. When supplies did get through, they still had to be moved from railheads to the front line. And it was the lorry which was to provide the last link in the chain of supply. It was during the First World War that the lorry began to take over from the horse. And there were times when its contribution changed history. This is northeastern France, and this looks like any ordinary piece of French provincial highway. But the kilometre stone indicates it must be something more. In fact, it's the road to the famous French city of Verdun, from the tiny township of Bar-le-Duc, 20 miles back. It's the words that tell the story. This is the Voie Sacrée. In 1916, when the Germans attacked Verdun, all the roads to the city were either cut or covered by their artillery, except this one. With ferocious energy, the French pumped men and supplies along this road to the defenders of Verdun. Every 14 seconds, a lorry went past this spot, carrying its vital supply of food, ammunition and soldiers. It's been said that without the internal combustion engine, Verdun could not have survived. The Voie Sacrée, or the Sacred Way, remains a monument to those lorries and the men who drove them. The Russian city of Leningrad also owed its salvation to motor transport. In 1941, it was besieged by the Germans, and food ran short as winter set in. Behind Leningrad, the vast Lake Ladoga froze, and the Russians built a road across the ice. Traffic control posts were set up along the route. Trucks drove day and night, a distance of 220 miles, with no room for error on the ice road. A single slice of bread was the daily ration for the people of Leningrad. During the siege, around 800,000 of them perished. As the Russian trucks moved across the ice road, the Luftwaffe tried to choke off the Leningrad lifeline. But the ice road stayed open until it melted in the spring. Leningrad was finally relieved in 1944, but it was the ice road of that first winter that saved it. Today's motor transport may seem to have a less dramatic role than that played out on the Voie Sacrée or the ice road. However, if soldiers are to receive the supplies they need to enable them to live and to fight, then the main supply routes behind them, roads, bridges, ferries, must remain open. Without this umbilical cord of supply, an army's hopes of victory are slender indeed.
Keeping an army supplied is obviously crucial to the survival of its soldiers. But the business of logistics plays a much wider role in the conduct of war. It often dictates not just when and where a battle takes place, but the way it will be fought. 130 years separate two task forces that set out from Britain, one to the Crimea, the other to the Falkland Islands. They had one thing in common, though. Each was very far from home with an immensely long line of communications. So the organization of their supplies would be bound to determine what sort of war they could fight. For almost everything that those soldiers required to live and to fight had first to be transported thousands of miles by ship. Ships were the only link between Britain and her expeditionary force besieging the Russian fortress of Sebastopol in the 1850s. Life on the bleak uplands of the Crimea was hard at the best of times. In winter, it was terrible. Incompetence mingled with inexperience to produce administrative chaos, and the campaign has become a byword for suffering and privation. Men died of exposure, while bales of warm clothing were flung into the harbor to form landing stages. All ranks looked like bearded scarecrows. Uniforms wore out and could not be replaced. Officers were requested to wear their swords, as there was no other way of distinguishing them from the men. For two years, the British army fought and endured. The British organization improved. The Russian resistance crumbled. Sevastopol fell, and a British victory was assured. When the Argentinians occupied the Falklands, they could easily reach the islands by transport aircraft from the mainland. Things were very different for the British. Simply getting the task force underway at all was a major logistic feat. Apart from the Royal Navy, merchant ships of all types had to be requisitioned. And then came the complex task of loading all the thousand and one things required by a fighting force. Brigadier Ian Baxter recalls those first hectic few days. By about five o'clock in the morning, I was able to uh, contact the various depots, alert them and get this outloading of some 5,000 tons of stores underway. We literally loaded as the ships came into harbour, uh, and this meant that we loaded not as we would want to do for an amphibious assault or an amphibious landing, but as the ships were there, and indeed to meet the requirements of the Board of Trade for their regulations of loading merchant ships. This created great problems later on, in that uh, we found that 5,000 jerry cans, for instance, which we thought were full of fuel, arrived totally empty because the Board of Trade refused to allow them to be loaded onto the ship containing petrol. Likewise, we had ammunition uh, in the lowest hold when we wanted it, obviously, in the upper hold so we could get it out. Canberra was going to be our major troop carrier. Now, she docked and within 72 hours had been equipped with one helicopter landing spot and sailed with two and a half thousand troops and another helicopter landing spot being built on the way to Ascension Island. The work did not stop when the task force sailed. Good use was made of a halt at Ascension Island, midway to the Falklands. Now, we were at Ascension Island for just under two weeks, and during that time, we were able to cross-deck and restow so that we got the artillery ammunition alongside the artillery pieces and generally prepared ourselves for what we now began to realize was not a very splendid exercise, but really was going to be going to war. The merchant ships chartered, especially for the campaign, carried most of the stores. Atlantic Conveyor was a floating ordnance depot. Atlantic Conveyor was carrying, of course, our Chinook helicopters. And with a limited amount of road transport, these were absolutely essential for logistic movement. But she was hit by an Exocet missile. Three of them were lost. Fortunately, one was actually flying at the time, having just bladed up, and he was able to use ships uh, across the ocean as stepping stones to eventually get himself into San Carlos. And that one Chinook helicopter was then the major logistic mover that we had for the whole of the campaign. And this, of course, not only forced us to increase the loads which the men carried, but ultimately uh, was the reason why we sent Sir Galahad with the Welsh Guards uh, and a vast amount of ammunition and stores round to Bluff Cove, and the result was a very sad loss of some 50 lives there.
they did not attack those brightly coloured British Rail ferries sitting there in San Carlos Water, or Canberra, like a great big white whale, the main target, carrying our men and carrying our supplies. They chose instead, very bravely, to attack the Royal Naval Escorts, the gunships, and indeed sunk and damaged uh, two of those. If the Argentinians turned their attack to our store ships, remembering we were 8,000 miles away and we lost one of those store ships, then quite clearly we were going to have a major problem. When logisticians have major problems, soldiers suffer, and if terrain and climate conspire against them, they die. In 1812, perhaps a quarter of a million of Napoleon's soldiers perished, frozen and starving, in the snows of Western Russia during the retreat from Moscow. He had fatally miscalculated the Russian winter. The same terrain was no kinder to the Germans 130 years later. The soldiers of the invading armies found to their cost that they had not been properly equipped for the harshness of the Russian winter. Even uh, our unit, which had come from France, we had no real winter clothing. I remember in the first winter I had summer uniform, uh, summer coat, and then already the temperature must have dropped to minus 50 centigrade, which was very cold. We had to pay the price by not being prepared for the Russian winter. I had three winters in Russia, and I know that uh, is a terrible experience. We were living in a very dangerous climate, and we were being told when you feel very cold, and then you suddenly feel warm, and there's no reason for feeling warm, that is a danger point. And I had one friend of mine who went out to do his business, and uh, that was in the evening, and next morning somebody said, where is Helmut, I think was his name, it doesn't really matter the name. And then we went out and looked for him, and Helmut was still in the position, trousers down and rolled up, lying in the snow, and he had a very happy expression on his face. And I saw quite a few died from cold. They all have a very pleasant expression, because feeling very cold is, is very, very bad, and suddenly you feel pleasantly warm, but that's death creeping up on you. revolutionized logistics and did much to change the way an army fights was the appearance of the transport aircraft. The one I'm in is probably the most famous military aircraft of them all, the Dakota. Still going strong after more than 40 years, and this one happens to be in service with the Israeli Air Force. It can carry over 20 fully equipped soldiers or two and a half tons of supplies. Tough and reliable, it can land on a rough and ready airstrip or drop its load by parachute. Aircraft like this have altered the course of campaigns, like Burma in 1944. The Supreme Commander, Lord Louis Mountbatten, told his men to rely on air supply. When the Jap tries his old trick of getting behind you and cutting your lines of communication, stay put. We'll supply you by air and you'll defeat him. From now on, there'll be no more retreat. In February 1944, part of the 7th Indian Division was encircled by the Japanese in Western Burma. Aircraft kept them supplied with food and ammunition. Gliders were used in the Chindid operations behind Japanese lines. Many of the troops were flown to landing zones deep in the jungle. They did not always have a happy landing. When the 14th Army went on to the offensive in 1944, its soldiers were supplied by the same accurate, low-level drops, which had earlier made their defensive battles possible. Group Captain Derek Grucock saw the campaign from the pilot's viewpoint. Well, the dropping zones um, are difficult to locate because they are obviously very, very small and in a very, very fantastic area, which to a large extent looks very much the same. It's all jungle and it's all green and it's just growing there, some of it's up and some of it's down, but it's not easy to find. We had to land on something like 800 yard strips in a fully laden Dakota, and this was particularly difficult on a strip like the one called Aberdeen, 
so you had to get the approach just right. That particular trip was the worst. I think there were about 20 wrecked Dakotas on the ground when we uh, finally located it. The job was made wonderful to me because of the aeroplane we were flying. It was absolutely magnificent for the job. You could stand it on a wingtip, you could fly it around almost like a fighter, and you could land it on a very short space. It really was a wonderful aeroplane. I don't think we could have done the job with any other kind of aeroplane. But air supply has its limitations. In 1954, the French were clinging desperately to a key position at Dien Bien Phu in Vietnam. Viet Minh artillery soon made the landing strip unusable, and supplies and reinforcements alike had to be parachuted in. Helicopters might have helped, but the French had too few. The troops on the ground were ringed tighter and tighter, and when the ground attack support aircraft were called in, the Viet Minh anti-aircraft gunners took a heavy toll. Surrounded by hills, French pilots called Dien Bien Phu the chamber pot. They inflicted heavy casualties on the Viet Minh. But eventually, the position was overrun by sheer weight of numbers. The French paid a heavy price for their lack of air support. They lost the cream of their fighting force and with it a colony. The United States in Vietnam enjoyed a logistic superiority unmatched in the history of war. In early 1968, the U.S. Marine combat base at Khe San was kept supplied by air power alone. Between the 21st of January and the 8th of April, there were over a thousand landings or airdrops on the position, delivering over 12,000 tons of supplies to the garrison. Jim Hebron, a member of it. On a daily basis, they would bring in C-123, these cargo aircraft, and uh, they, the lifeline, that, that fed us beans, bullets, and bandages that we needed to survive during that period of time. It became quite hectic after a while because we shone the airstrip so heavily, we would walk the waters right down the runway on the planes, and they hit a number of the planes. And for a short period of time, the airstrip was cut off, and we were quite concerned. We wouldn't have enough material to fight back with. His son was under constant shell and mortar fire. Men could take cover in their trenches and bunkers, but planes on the airstrip were sitting targets. Helicopter gunships swooped low to suppress the Viet Cong fire. Trench warfare had returned. But defenders on the surrounding hills faced a crisis. There was, for one thing, a, a, a marked lack of water. Everything we had had to be brought in by helicopter. Water is heavy. Uh, it was uh, a great risk to bring in a, a helicopter load of water. So the conditions were not very sanitary. There was no electric power. There was no way to keep clean because we only owned the top of the hill. The North Vietnamese owned the bottom, and that's where the water was. And some of the people up there went without showers for, I guess, four or five months. And without hot food, there was no hot food for close to three and a half, four months. One lived on sea rations, and two or three of them a day. And after about two or three weeks, they're boring. Right? After two or three months, they're disgusting. Boring and disgusting they might have been, but it was these rations, often dropped straight onto the airstrip in low-level runs, that kept the defenders of Khe San going. 
helicopters, like the huge two-rotor Chinook, also played their part in flying in all the garrison's requirements. Ammunition for artillery and small arms was a major preoccupation, and even replacement field guns were brought in by air. The guns that they used were 105s, which are regular artillery pieces, and all six of them were destroyed, twisted metal hunks, and we could watch the helicopters bring in six brand new ones the next, next morning. Vietnam was above all the war of the helicopter. The Americans used them lavishly, both as gunships and for the transport of men and equipment. North Vietnamese gunners found them elusive targets, as Colonel Dabney recalls. The problem the enemy had was that it took about 25 to 30 seconds from the time the mortar round was fired until it hit. And since they didn't know until the helicopter landed exactly what its position was to be, we used that 25 second period in order to load casualties and the dead or to offload critical supplies. But if we did not get the helicopter off within 30 seconds or so, that we probably were going to lose it and take substantial casualties among the people on it and servicing it. Air power helped the defenders of Khe Sanh in other ways. Ground attack aircraft bombed positions around the base, sometimes just outside the perimeter. Giant B-52s struck from high altitude, unheard and unseen. The B-52 raids raised morale. One never even saw the airplane. One just saw the tremendous result of the concussions. The, uh, they just rock you right in your trench. They put it in that close. You know, the North Vietnamese Army lost between 13,000 and 22,000 troops in the field. And because of the uh, concentrated air support we had, uh, we felt very strongly that it saved our ass. The Second World War, British Field Marshal Lord Wavell summed up the importance of logistics. The more I see of war, the more I realize how it all depends on administration and transportation.